Hi everybody, I'm the author Patrick Lorcan Woods. This is the trilogy, part one, Madame Bittersweet Goodbyes. And from the book, we are up to chapter eight and nine. Chapter eight is in Dublin's fair city. This is continuing with the day out that Madame has decided to reward her children with the day out in Dublin with Fred the gardener as company and overseeing the events at Croke Park and different things. And then I'm going to go into chapter nine, which is called Operation Shamrock, which happened during the war years where Ireland took on the children of Europe, war torn countries like Berlin in Germany, and brought them to Ireland and re rehomed them for a while until the war ended. And then the children were placed back with their families back in their home countries. And it was called Operation Shamrock, Shamrock being the national symbol for Ireland. So we are back in chapter eight in Dublin's fair city. Remember, this is seen through the eyes of Nathan, the whole story, one of the ch five children that Madame is rearing in secrecy. And she's decided to reward them because they were very good during his eminence's stay with the treacherous father, Peter. But Nathan has been left a warning by Father Peter that he will come back at some stage as punishment and he will punish him for his subordinates towards him. Also you've got the situation of when he was in Dublin he ran away from the car and went on a trip, a memory trip, and found his home place and where him and his mother used to live before he was taken to be reared by Madame. And Everything is confusing for Nathan, but he's decided to calm down, let the day progress. But also, there's going to be Madame punishing him as well for that upset. So there's a lot going on with Nathan personally. He's seen his homestead. He's reliving the moment in his head, but he's decided to keep calm and allow him and his brothers to have this special day that Madame has had promised them. It is their first day outside the walls of Linden Hall where they've been re reared. And let's see what happens. Thank you for listening. If you like, please subscribe to my channel. Please like and comment. And don't forget that the Madame Trilogy Part 1, Bittersweet Goodbyes, is out on Kindle, both in paperback and in Kindle as well. And we should continue as soon as I because it's all live as soon as I bring it up. So let's begin. Chapter 8 in Dublin's Fair City. In the back of the car we were greeted with anger and hostility from the rest of my brothers. In fact, they began to talk in whispers to one another for most of the day, rebuffing us, us being Patrick, the, the son of Fred. By totally looking through us with angered eyes without as much as a flinch, because they were still upset that they had both ran away from the car and left Madame very upset. Needless to say, Patrick and I whispered for the entire journey too. Eventually, Fred dropped us outside a place called Cleary's in O'Connell Street in Dublin, then looked for a decent parking space to park the car. Madame brought us to the drapery section of the store where an odd-looking elderly man greeted us. Madame discussed with him what she required. Then she told us to remain vigilant while the tailor ran a tape up and down our legs and measured us for quarter-length trousers. Fred immediately returned to Madame, whereupon she turned to him and said, Why I bother, I shall never know. But this is what mothers do, I suppose. The old habit of buying for one means, Fred, you feel compelled to buy for them all and I could not leave out one, even though my patience has run out with not one, but the two of them already, she sighed. You're too kind, but I will hush, Fred. Leave Patrick and the bill to me. It's the least I can do for you driving us here safely, and please don't argue. It's an honour, insisted Madame. Thank you, Madame. Most kind. And Patrick, don't you have something to say, asked Fred. Yes, uncle, now that I'm allowed to speak, it's a kind gesture, and I thank thee, but don't expect me to adhere to the silly rule of not speaking all day. I'm not really your concern. 
I knew Madame ought not to have bothered buying for me, because I'm not your concern either. After the novelty of having me wears off, maybe these trousers will come in handy when the state recommends me for the workhouse, replied Patrick. I'm shocked. I'm just shocked and dismayed at this hurtful outburst. I'll talk to you later. But for now, we'll all continue this morning as planned, with no more interruptions or upsets from neither of you two. Understood, implored Fred. Yes, Uncle, loud and clear, frowned Patrick. And after everybody was measured and fitted with new trousers, Tom turned to Madame and begged, Can we go for something to eat now, Madame? I'm terribly hungry and my stomach hurts. Turning around, she replied, Of course, dear, we shall. We shall go to Bewley's. It's said to be one of those finest places to eat for light lunches and coffee. Their reputation exceeds them. Come, everybody. Let's eat there. Collect your bags from this assistant, then follow Fred and me. There was a spontaneous round of applause. We all patted Tom on his back in a show of affection. Marcus remained silent towards me most of the day. Each time I went to make amends, he retreated from me, causing me to fill up with guilt. Only then did I realise how much animosity I had caused. Madame sensed my remorse. She refrained from showing any favouritism, accepting no form of apology. Feverishly, I made polite conversation until the sound of my own voice made it apparent they wanted to punish me for the rest of the day. Later, Fred decided we should all go ahead whilst he parked the car somewhere else. I asked if I could accompany him. Madame looked puzzled, but agreed, saying, if you must. Fred half-heartedly smiled and nodded in agreement. So at last, it looked as though I had my chance to put some logic and reason into the events that had occurred privately with Fred. When Madame and my brothers had left, Fred and I went to find the car. Once we had arrived, I sat up in the front, beside Fred, and looked at him hard. Then I asked if, I, if he thought I was a strange person. In response, he, he said, Nathan, you're an oddball to say the least. What a question. But the answer is no, because deep down inside you're a good person. However, you do have many issues that need addressing, just like Patrick, no doubt. These will take some time to deal with, but you're lucky to have plenty of time to do this. Why do you ask me of all people, inquired a tired Fred? Because you're an objective man and you never become too personal, Fred. I shall explain what happened. Firstly, I honestly did run after that girl to retrieve your hat, and then the whole series of events overtook me. I feel you're the only person who understands me better than most, and I hope that after listening to me, you might subtly tell my story to Madame and help make things better. Can I explain to you what exactly happened, I implored Fred. Of course you can, Nathan. I'm honoured to be graced in this way. I do like to see myself as a father figure in some way to you all, nodded Fred. You're much more than that, Fred, and because I think of you so highly, I want to tell you of my exploits, I smiled. I then began to divulge what happened with Patrick and myself. Getting out of the car, we walked slowly as I began explaining everything in detail until we arrived outside Bewley's in Grafton Street. Well, well, it's a true saying that when it rains, it pours, but in your case, Master Nathan, it thunders, Fred replied, shaking his head. It's not my fault, Fred. Madame is the only one that tells us all the time that there are reasons for everything. And I'm sure that's why I ran after the girl and ended up finding my old homestead, I insisted. Yes, but I'm not sure how Madame will handle this. In fact, to be very honest, I'm not sure she'll... In fact, to be very honest, I'm sure she'll be disturbed to know that your natural birth mother is alive and might someday come back to you, into your life. It would upset her too much to tell her this straight away. Instead, I'll inform her. And Nathan, when the time is right, that's when I'll do it, I promise, okay? Fine, fine, that's, that's all I want from you, no more, no less. Thank you, dear Fred. You're a true scholar, as they say. I'm fortunate to have you, not just as a father figure, but also as a friend. And I hugged Fred. Now, let us find Madame and join the others, as the day is still young and there's much more to do and places to visit, replied Frey eagerly. Once inside Bewley's, the place astounded me. The sheer volume of pastries and food and display mesmerised both Fred and myself. 
Everything was attractively displayed in glass cabinets. The mouth-watering array of cakes had me spellbound. Wow, Fred, look at those pastries over there. I cried with excitement. Yes, my boy, it whets your appetite all right, doesn't it? Fred laughed. I cannot believe that in one place it has so many goodies. Can we buy some and take them home for Sheena and Nellie to savour? I pleaded. Why not, Master Nathan? I'm sure they'd appreciate the thought. But out of my suspicions, none of the goodies you purchased would last a full journey, cheered Fred, pushing me away from the cookies. Where should we look for the others, I asked. The best place is to look for a quiet spot. That is where we'll surely find them, assured Fred. Over in the furthest corner of the premises were indeed Madame and all the others. All of them were enjoying munching away to their heart's content. Faces that half an hour ago were telling a story of woe were now telling one of joy. As soon as they saw us, their screams of delight grew louder as Madame ordered extra tea and scones. Then a woman in a refined outfit made of tweed and lined in fur turned around and commented on all of us gleefully eating away. I have to say, you have a lovely bunch of boys. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, said the woman. My name is of no relevance, miss, replied madame. Oh, my name is Kathleen, Kathleen Maguire, she continued in a raised tone. People know me as Madame Kathleen, was it? This is how I'd like to be referred to, answered Madame sharply. I, I, I just want to say the boys are a healthy looking bunch of lads, if you ever saw a group. Are all of them yours, then, Madame, continued Kathleen. Yes, each and every one of them, Kathleen. I'm happy to say that all of these delightful boys are mine, insisted now in a rate Madame. It's just that they're quite an assortment of colours and shades, if I may say so. I always wanted a boy. However, my husband Connor here, and I never ma never quite managed to achieve it, Kathleen tutted sadly. They say God works in mysterious ways, and he did when he blessed me with so much joy time and time again, added Madame. What ages are they? Kathleen inquired further. Aye, questions, questions, Kathleen. Good for the mind, but not for the heart and soul. I'm tired now. I bid you good day as my tea is getting cold, replied a frustrated madame. But you never answered my question, madame, for they all look remarkably the same both in age and structure, she continued. I've two sets of twins and one older boy. I shall leave your inquisitive mind to work out the rest, madame huffed. But I hate to burden you, like some people do with their playful imaginations. But I prefer to finish this line of inquiry now before I lose my sense of dexterity and manners. Just futile questions. Have I made myself clear, Connor? replied Madame abruptly, ignoring Kathleen. Oh, indeed you have, Madame, smiled Connor. He turned around and told his wife to stop asking any more questions and not to provoke a row, and Kathleen hampered from going on any further, left with Connor in a sharp tone of voice, and bidded Madame a good day. Madame, looking underneath her hat, turned a blind eye, whilst at the same time winked towards her creamy-faced family. Then staring at Madame, Luke quizzed her. Why did that lady want to know so much about us, Madame? After all, we do not recognise her from Linden Hall or anywhere else for that matter. In response, she replied, Dearest Luke, in life you will learn that there are people who just want to know other people's business, even though it's irrelevant to them. It's also immaterial to them if they cause provocation by asking questions that become too personnel. To satisfy their curiosity, they just continue asking more. That's until you use your skills to necessarily deal with such people. Kathleen was just an example of one of those provocative people. I, Luke, displayed an example of how to deal with such a person, smiled Madame. Quite, responded Ruth. Luke gulping. Everybody finished their pastries and washed them down then with iced tea. A healthier option, Madame thought, than to give us any further lemonade. Madame insisted I would take my punishment as soon as we all got back home. She decided that for the rest of the day we would all act like a loving family. This way we would have fond memories of our time in Dublin. Excited by the transformation in everyone's attitude, I said a quiet prayer to God and thanked them for creating food like cakes and scones. Now, Fred, what do you suggest we do next? I shall leave this decision 
totally in your hands, insisted Madame. Hmm, I think we should treat everyone with a bit of real Dublin. Why not take in a game of Gaelic football at Croke Park? After all, it's traditional on a Sunday in Dublin. Fred smiled. Immediately my brothers and I roared with delight and pulled at Madame from all angles, begging her to agree. She played the devil's advocate for a while and let on she could not hear us, and Fred chuckled as we pulled away from all sides. Madame left tuppence as a thank you to the waiter and thanked the woman behind the counter for such a, a memorable occasion. Fred and Madame walked arm in arm back towards the car, quietly laughing together and choosing to ignore our insistent plea incessant pleas to go to Crow Park and see the match. Patrick mourned he would go there alone if they refused to take us, and all our commotion came to a sudden stop as everyone glared at him in a rather haphazard way. Patrick quickly changed his tune about going it alone when both Fred and Madame stopped walking and glared at him. Instead, he smiled awkwardly and joked, saying that he was only messing, <laughs> and laughed. As everyone frog-marched behind Madame and Fred, Patrick remained silent. It seemed like we were walking forever and our feet beca became swollen and sore as a result. Fred deliberately avoided the Manchester Square area. After walking through a series of side streets, we, we did arrive at Croke Park to a spectacle. There to meet us were hundreds of people waiting to go in through the terminals to watch the football game. And Fred referred to the sport as the sport of all sports. Seeing the home of the National Gaelic Football it was breathtaking as we edged closer to the ticket person. Madame became increasingly uncomfortable when she found out there would be very few women at the match. Indeed, it seemed to her to be very male-dominated. Fred reassured her that he would not leave her side, except for the interval. Madame got a measurable pleasure looking at our excited faces as we purchased our tickets and followed the crowds through the turnstiles to our positions up on Hill 16. Women and men were separated for a while until they reached their given stand at the fixture. And when we had collecti collectively gathered as one, Fred presented Madame with a cold, with a fold-out chair, known as a propeller stool. Watched by a stream of envious onlookers, she had the dual satisfaction of knowing that when she got tired or bored, she could rest her feet. Thanking Fred for his sense of foresight, she remained standing until the match was well underway. When the match began, she casually sat down and began to light a cigarette. From a small flask, Madame, Madame consumed a bit of the other stuff, and that was as a mere gesture of passing time more quickly, <laughs> or so she said. The match progressed well, and we shouted our support for both teams as they played a wonderful game of both skills and tactics, and beforehand we had heard off and only imagined what Gaelic football would be like by listening to the radio with Nelly as she reminisced what it would be like what it used to be like in her day. The actual live event was far more spectacular than that. Madame handed out Nelly's pre-packed lunches, and as we ate, Dublin, became, Dublin suddenly scored a goal, and we all jumped up and down in jubilation. Luke spluttered his food everywhere as he tried to eat and shouted at the same time, and all of us laughed at his foolishness. Madame fell off her seat, her flask hitting the ground, spilling on impact. When ten minutes later, Monaghan scored a goal and suddenly everybody around it exploded into a second rip-roar of song, we just laughed uncontrollably as she stood up, wiping herself down before joining in with the celebrations. Giggling like a child, she said, if you cannot beat them, join them, I always say, hey Fred, and then she hiccuped. Quite right, madame, he replied, smiling. Throughout the game, there was a lot more shouting and soul-searching for madame. She saw the freedom and delight this day had given us already, and she wept silently because her heart also knew it would be the last free day we would all enjoy for some time to come. My memory of Croke Park was one of thousands of people. Croke Park was thousands of people, mostly men, shouting loudly. There was something of that vocal joy which thrilled me in the tenderness of these men's voices. Every, every time in unison as they chorused their delight, when a goal or a point was scored. It was as though their songs and chants lit, lit a flame of hope in these dark times for all of us to hear. I remember that day well as the day I forgot about all of the things that troubled me. I gushed inside repeatedly as the teams scored their goals and I smiled a lot too at those passionate Gaelic, football, Gaelic voices 
that sung their hearts out until the very end of the match. When the mayhem of our day was replaced, it was replaced by a mystical and equally deafening silence. Heading towards the car, Madame said she would like to finish by taking my brothers and myself on a trip around Dublin. Sheila had handed Madame a guide to the city centre, which showed places of interest. We drove for at least two hours as Madame pointed out some of the historical facts and buildings of the city. And after seeing the general post office, we visited Trinity College where she was educated, Dublin Castle, the Phoenix Park and St. James Gate Brewery, famous for the Black Stout today known as the Guinness factory. There we were not allowed to view inside, but Madame explained the history of the place. She then told us she could have, we could have lemonade in a place called Keller's and a chocolate treat as well. As our final visit in Dublin, Madame took us to a place called Trinity Hall in the Rathmines area off Dublin, where she, was, where she resided at an all girls accommodation. Emotional and feeling tired, Madame finished a sightseeing tour by leaving us all in the car and sending Fred to a provision store called Loonham's to purchase us a cooked pigeon. She requested it be divided into small pieces. Fred also bought some bread for us to munch on for the journey home. And Madame told us that she was going to purchase another pair of trousers and a coat for each of us as our final treat of the day. As five young excited teenagers, we readily agreed this was a good idea. Therefore, after eating the pigeon Fred had purchased and some of the bread, we headed towards Grafton Street again, where some equally amazing clothing shops were located. Selecting the clothes we wanted from the shop we wanted, Madame Fred, Madame Fred, my, myself, my brothers and I, I'm sorry, I have to repeat that. Selecting the clothes we wanted, Madame Fred, my brothers and I finally returned to the car exhausted. Madame kissed Fred gently on the cheek and stated that nothing would ever come between them as friends. Those words, after such a fine day, cut a deep wound in Fred's heart. Embarrassed, he looked away after her show of affection. As Madame got inside the car, she suddenly noticed at her feet a piece of paper with writing on it. Placing her gloves on, she picked it up and noticed that it had her name on the front with the inscription, to the dearest and sweetest person I know, Madame. It was a poem entitled Somebody Else. As Fred organised our seating arrangements and some blankets to cover us, Madame discreetly began to read the poem. It quoted, Somebody else's tired hands and somebody else's wounded feet were never too weary to minister. And when somebody's smile was sweet, somebody else's love was spent and tears were wept in vain. Shall I then count my weeping's cost, or grudge thee a little pain? Somebody else was left alone, beneath a, a live tree, and nobody cared for somebody else more than they do for me. But away past lives, dull glooming, across the crystal sea, somebody else and I shall live for all eternity. eternity. Madame was stunned at how the poem echoed the obvious love he had for her. Instead of responding positively, Madame threw it away and sat in the car, disturbed. Meanwhile, Fred checked the road for any horse nails that might puncture the car as he swerved around to take the homeward journey back to Linden Hall. Madame remained transfixed on the road ahead while Fred remained cautiously optimistic that one day the woman next to him would be his beloved wife and us his adoptive sons. As he smiled, brimming over with inner satisfaction, Madame only responded with a courteous smile she would have given any one of her employees. The journey home was a long and perilous one in many ways, and Fred had to dodge potholes and look out for nails and anything else that might cause a puncture. It became a slow and arduous task to get us home in one piece. The whole day had brought out a mixture of inner feelings the boys had never experienced before. There was excitement, optimism, regret, exasperation, and a real sense of hope for the future. Of course, when the day was finally complete, there was utter exhaustion, so we slept in the back of the car until we arrived safely home. Madame remained silent throughout, which was unusual for her, until we arrived at the gates of Linden Hall. Oh, at last, what a long journey that was. Well done, Fred, you got us home in one piece. 
You're truly the best. Now if you'd go and call Annie and Sheila, they shall help you with putting all the boys to bed, said Madame. Certainly, Madame. You go ahead. I'll look after things from here, he nodded in response. You're most kind, Fred. I shall retire to the drawing room. I don't want to be disturbed, so I shall bid you good night in advance. Sleep well. But there are lots of chores to do tomorrow, and you need your sleep as much as anybody else. Well, good night, Madame. Do sleep well. Madame retired to the drawing room and made for the drinks cabinet. Pouring herself a large brandy, she walked slowly over to the fire and then sat down. Slumping onto the side of the chair, Madame buried her head in the corner and began to cry uncontrollably for what seemed like an eternity. Her unhappiness as she recalled Fred's poem was suddenly replaced by a chuckle. This was due to her recollection of Luke choking while cheering at the Dublin team. <laughs> Dear funny Luke, she thought. As Madame watched the burning embers of the fire diminish, her warm cheeks reflected the midday sun she had caught whilst in Croke Park. Her shivering body had succumbed to the brandy, which now warmed the lining of her stomach. Letting out a deep breath, she sighed and thought about her relationship with Fred. Madame's eyes were burning from the many hours that ticked by, and with so many thoughts in her head, everything became a blur until, oh, I say, Madame, what are you doing here at this ungodly hour in the morning? Ah, you poor thing, you must have dozed off. I was having you a nightcap. Now come on, let's be having you, insisted Nellie. Nellie put her arm around Madame's shoulder and led her up back upstairs to the solace and tranquility of her own room. There she rested in her bed before falling asleep, sheepishly thanking Nellie in the process. Looking at her in a disturbing manner, Nellie recognised the symptoms again of a broken heart. But in her head she asked, But how could this be? She wasn't aware of any recent suitors to Linden Hall seeking Madame's attention. So Nellie walked away and dismissed these thoughts as irrational and totally unfounded. <laughs> God, what a silly woman I'm becoming, she thought. Imagine, Madame in love again. She, the only man around here is Fred. And with that she let out a hearty laugh, shaking her head and dismissing the notion that Fred could be a suitor on any level as totally preposterous. Nellie then headed to bed. The day, ended it, 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 it has, the day ended as it had begun, with everybody at home, asleep, and now at peace. Oh, that, everybody, is chapter 8. This now is called chapter 9, and introduces what I said at the start of the video, Operation Shamrock. We should begin. Next morning, Sheila brought Madame a breakfast at the late hour of 9am, and Nellie organised the staff that had been arranged from Glendora Village that morning with their duties. My brothers and I were at the Latin class with Father Tom, while Madame fluffed her pillows and settled down to eat before opening her post. She had a letter from his eminence and intrigued her, and after carefully deliberating what the contents might hold, she opened it and began to read. Stunned by the simplicity of its content, Madame reread it and began to prop herself up properly in bed. After placing the tray at the bottom of the bed, she felt compelled to put on her nightgown, feeling she had to dress for the occasion. A Protestant woman getting a letter of such repute and standing from a senior person within the church was within the confines of reason unheard of. Moreover, the locals would deplore it if they ever got wind of such a thing. So she began to read it again. Dear Madame, I have the honour of conveying you the expression of the Holy Father's cordial, cordial gratitude for the hospitality you showed as Father Peter and his eminence stayed at Linden Hall. His Holiness is aware of the labours involved in making Linden Hall such a successful treat for countless numbers of priests that frequent this beautiful home. No doubt it has been motivated by your ardent zeal for having somewhere for the sanctification of priests and developing an establishment of the Kingdom of Christ in the hearts of men that visit. 
It has been a success because you have the same apolistic strength that sustained and strengthened you in your long years of devoted toil before the Church's intervention. It is, therefore, the Pontiff's earnest prayer that your praiseworthy efforts in this no noble cause may be blessed with the continuing soul in success for the future. It is in the pledge of that celestial favour that he lovingly imparts his paternal apolistic benediction to you. I gladly avail myself of this occasion to express to you my deep gratitude on behalf of the Church. With sentiments of high esteem and cordial regard, I remain your friend and servant whenever you need me. Yours sincerely in Christ, Father Ambrose Cannon. Madame fluffed the pillows in deep satisfaction that her efforts had gone all the way to Rome, and the Pope had now heard of Linden Hall, and favoured it immensely as his own personal choice for Irish priests to stay, either when visiting, living, or needing a break. Well, 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 Father Peter, she thought. I wonder when you read this how you'll handle it. Delighted to have the backing of His Holiness and Father Ambrose, she smelt the letter and got a glowing satisfaction knowing she now had friends in the highest place within the church hierarchy. hierarchy. I almost feel religious, she giggled. When it rains, it pours, and Madame dressed and then entered the kitchen. She came upon my brothers and I, rambling on about the previous day's outing. As we handed up the presents we had bought to Sheila and Nelly, they sat at either side of the kitchen table, listening to our continuous ramblings. Marcus and Tom were examining the various bus and train tickets Fred had found on the pavements of Dublin and gave as souvenirs. The advertising on the tickets fascinated them. Each one of them had adverts prominently displayed, which was commonplace. Next, just as Madame was about to sit down on the table, the butler John rang the bell, insisting it was an important call from the Mother Superior. Madame turned round swiftly and headed for the privacy of the library. There she picked up the phone and took up her usual stance and tone while dealing with the woman she referred to as Father Peter's glove puppet. Madame speaking. I believe this is important, Mother Superior. Why is it so important you have to personally ring me at this hour of the morning? Madame, it's come to our attention that Red Cross is looking for the, the host home for the children of Operation Shamrock. Have you heard of this at all? inquired the Mother Superior cautiously. Let me see. Operation Shamrock. Why, of course I have. I do read the papers and listen to the radio. These children brought over from war torn countries, I believe, and housed in Ireland until such a time they can return to their natural homesteads. Is it not? Well, madame, they're looking for a house to house some children who are not successfully rehomed. This is where you come in. Father Peter has informed me that Linden Hall could cater for some of those children perhaps in the servants' quarters. He's also told me that Rome considers the housing of these children to be of the utmost importance. Excuse me while I take a drink. <coughs> <coughs> Dry throat, everybody. Therefore, you're welcome. You are welcome to four children. You are to welcome four children tomorrow morning. They come from France and Germany. Their English is minimal, but they're extremely good-natured girls. Taking a deep breath, Madame flustered and then said, What did you just say, Mother Superior? That I'm to receive girls? But that man, Father, Father Peter, told me I would never be able to have that luxury ever. What has suddenly changed? In fact, tell me how many girls I am to receive again. You are to host four girls. Two German too French and Father Peter thought this would even things out nicely with the boys you already have replied Mother Siberia those five boys you refer to Mother Siberia are my sons and now increases my responsibility twice over without notice and he calls that even well he was always pompous but the arrogance of the man to expect me to go along with his plans in order to make him look good is either sheer exploitation or a farce He's taken a laudable situation at a moment's notice and turned it into, yes, a farcical one. 
However, my resources are many, and I'll not be deterred from carrying out my duties. After all, if the Sisters of Charity can't cope, I'm sure I will stop, madame. I did not say that you... Really, Mother Superior, the last thing I want to do is idly gossip on the phone when preparations have to be made. I shall not take them before eight in the morning. However, they must all arrive before midday, as the midday sun does not agree with me. So I shall expect them between those hours, added Madame. I will have them taken over tomorrow morning before midday, then. Bless you, my child, replied Mother Superior. Immediately, Madame slammed down the phone and walked frantically round in a circle. She made phone calls to Father Tom, advising him to prepare for some extra students. She hoped some study would alleviate any boredom the, boredom the girls might feel whilst living at Linden Hall. The schooling would now have to be an option open to the girls as well as the boys. Father Tom told her it would be no problem for him, as he formerly lived in France and had learned Latin and French. As well as this, he said his grandmother had been a native of Germany and had taught him German whilst he was growing up. Immediately began, Madame began preparing for the girls' arrival. Later that morning after breakfast, my brothers and I were told to assemble in the drawing room. We did so in orderly fashion, anticipating that Patrick and I were to be punished for our disappearing act whilst in Dublin. But this wasn't the case. As we sat and looked around the room, nothing could have prepared us for this wonderful sight that entered the room. As Madame walked in, as the door opened, a vision of beauty we'd never encountered before in our years living at Linden Hall greeted us. Madame had changed her entire look completely. Her usual tight up hair was now free and flowing down to her shoulders. She wore a beautiful yet simplistic ankle length skirt. Light brown in colour, this cotton ensemble was finished off with a cardigan, an ivory high neck blouse on and a gold brooch. Madame's hair, black and curly, now had a film star look, similar to those photos that we only ever saw in newspapers. And as she stood and coughed at the door, she threw her arms out, wide, declaring, you will all catch flies if you're not careful. Has no one got anything to say? You look so young and beautiful, madame. But what's the occasion? We've never seen you like this, ever. In fact, do we still get to call you madame? Or has your name changed along with your new look? Asked madame. <laughs> you are comical, Ad Adam. No, my name is still the same. It's just that, as I looked at myself this morning, I thought... What a horrible sight I must portray. Without due consideration, I simply put a little imagination in how, to I should, how I should look. And this is how French women dress. And I thought that, in honour of my French mother, I would dress so today. I hope you all approve. If not, I could always change back to my former self, smiled madame. The response was universal, as myself and my brothers complimented her. Except for me. Madame turned and looked at me when the commotion had, had died down. And I asked her, what is the real reason we are here? And you've asked us suddenly to turn up. And you have suddenly turned up with a new Im image. Is it because there is a man in your life? Oh, Nathan, unless one has fallen from the skies, the answer to that is no. Alas, there is no filling you at all. Yes, there is a reason. And it's because we have visitors arriving in the morning, important ones, who will live at Linden Hall for a while. So with the new visitors, I wanted to adopt, well, a more caring and new image, Nathan, one that would be less frightening to them. Today I wanted to try out that change, she replied. But Dan proceeded to explain that the Mother Superior, what had the Mother Superior just announced. And she said she didn't know the names of the children, but that all would become clearer upon their arrival. Madame explained that these new children were like us boys, taken away from their families. And in their cases, though, it was because the cities were being suffered. The cities was, were suffering greatly because of the war. Their needs were greater than ours. And so they were to be drawn, showing compassion and understanding upon their arrival due to their predicament. My brothers and I listened to Madame's account of the war and the way that the countries were born and had economically declined. There were no jobs, no, there was a scarcity of food in their country, she told us, and they were coming to Ireland specifically because we had both. Then she told everybody else to prepare the rooms for their stay. 
It was going to be a case of all hands on deck the following morning when they did arrive. My brothers and I had never been in the company of girls before, and we anticipated a lot of aggravation. And Elliot always told us that we were fortunate in that boys never had cat fights, but girls did all the time. That was because they were demanding creatures, as we would one day find out. Now it seemed that that day had finally arrived, and we were to live with some girls. That everybody is part one of chapter nine, Operation Shamrock. I hope you've enjoyed it so far.